Resources Policy and Legacy Finance Committee. Today is Wednesday, March 23rd, 2022, uh, approximately 1 p.m. We are a little late because we ha have caused celebrity in the audience. We have uh, Senator Lazart with us today, so um, we all love to visit. Um, up today, members, is Senate File 3687, Senator Johnson. This bill will be laid over for possible inclusion. And Senator Johnson, go ahead when you're ready. I believe most of your testifiers are remote today. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and members. Uh, it's a real honor today to be uh, here before you with Senate File 3687. 3687 is a very short bill. If you look at it, it's one pager talks about two main changes in there. Number one, the, the types of tires uh, an ATV can have, and then also uh, the weight limit. Now, many of you might be a, a little curious about the weight limit issue, and that's really the, the real substantive change within this bill is the weight limit issue. Um, but as we are changing our vehicles, our recreational vehicles from uh, what has been uh, these internal gas combustion engines, uh, to a new whole market of electric. As all of you know, with a uh, vehicle, if you buy an electric car, it's gonna weigh more than a gas powered car, a similar looking uh, vehicle. The same is true for ATVs. And thus, in order to prepare a way for the future uh, in our trail system, in our recreational market of ATVs, a quieter, more environmentally friendly ATV, uh, thus the, the weight limits on those uh, need to go up on certain trails. With that, Madam Chair, I don't want to eat up a whole lot of time talking about uh, this when we got such great testifiers. So if you would, uh, I'd like to turn it over to them. Thank you, Senator Johnson. And I, I think this is a really uh, important conversation to have going forward when we look for the future of what's going to happen with our trail system and, and as ATVs involved. So I, I, it looks like you have a, a really good um, group of presenters uh, to talk to us today. So first up is Mr. Burke uh, from Polaris. Mr. Burke, welcome to the committee. And please state your name for the record and yes, proceed when you're ready. Good morning, Madam Chair, or good afternoon, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, members, my name is J.R. Burke. I'm the Director of State and, State and Local Government Affairs for Polaris Industries. Uh, first, let me say thank you for spending a few minutes to visit with me. Um, as, as Senator Johnson said, this legislation, the, the substantive piece of this legislation is the increase of the weight from 2,000 pounds to 3,000 pounds. And the reason this is important is, is Minnesota is blessed with a thriving outdoor economy. You know, we, we have uh, $8.5 billion worth of revenue that's generated from Minnesota's outdoor economy each year, 90,000 jobs, $4.3 billion in wages. And what I'm happy to say is that ATVs, snowmobiles, and other power sports equipment is second only to fishing in Minnesota and its contribution to Minnesota's outdoor economy. And that's pretty, pretty astonishing in the land of 10,000 lakes. So we're very proud of that. For Polaris's part, um, you know, we're a headquartered company here. Uh, we're honored to play an important role in that, but we started as an independently owned small business in 1954. Three individuals started Polaris as a snowmobile company. And today <clears throat> we are a, a global power sports leader with snowmobiles, ATVs, boats, motorcycles, and other outdoor power equipment. Uh, we started in Roseau in Senator Johnson's district, uh, but today we have we have Minnesota facilities in Roseau, Medina, Plymouth, and Wyoming. Uh, Minnesota is home to our largest contingent of employees, 3,500 of them, uh, 1,400 of which are in Roseau, Minnesota, with the need to add another 100 people immediately, because on Friday, what we're going to announce is a $22 million capital investment in our Roseau plant, um, which is pretty astonishing that... Um, as we've seen the outdoor economy continue to grow, uh, Minnesota businesses also have the chance to grow. And so Polaris's investment in outdoors doesn't start, stop there. We have a Polaris Trails grant program that we provide um, resources to clubs and uh, other uh, local agencies, $2.7 million we've provided from our trail grant program, which helps with things like infrastructure, uh, equipment purchases and the like uh, for local at the local level. And then finally, we recently announced a $5 million investment in the National Forest Foundation. The National Forest Foundation works with federal partners to preserve and protect our natural spaces on federal lands across Minnesota, including the Superior National Forest, the Chippewa National Forest. So we're very proud of our, our, our spot here in Minnesota's outdoor economy. 
But Polaris is also leading the way, as, as Senator Johnson said, on electrification. It's an important next step, which is driven by consumer demand. The recent introduction of our Ranger XB Kinetic is the fully electric class two ATV. Uh, the importance of this legislation, I don't think can be understated uh, because when we launched this product in 2021, late 2021, pre-sold orders, those orders that are delivered through our 50 plus independently owned small business dealers across Minnesota sold out in less than two hours. That's a pretty substantial statement. When we, this is the very first that we've ever done and in, two, in less than two hours, those pre-sold orders were out of stock. To make them more desirable though, there are offsets and that's weight. The battery packs technology today is heavier. And in order to get the, off, the, 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 the counterbalance, the weight, we also get some benefits with uh, gas emissions as well as noise emissions, making the outdoors more attractive to, to a new type of customer is also helpful. So we have those offsets. We also have this weight, would also, this weight bill would also be important for the perspective of cabs. We live in a state of extreme seasonal conditions. So if you have somebody purchasing a machine that has a cab, they do it because they wanna be able to plow their driveway in comfort in the wintertime, and they wanna be able to ride their ATV on the trails in the summer months out of the dust and out of the heat. And those are very reasonable expectations. And that's what Polaris and others seek to provide consumers. You know, many states have already updated their ATV definitions. Um, to keep pace with these tre trends. Today, 34 states permit ATVs up to 3,000 pounds, including 15 minutes from here in Wisconsin. And far beyond that, already this year, two states, Mississippi and Utah, have unanimously enacted legislation increasing the ATV weight up to 3,500 pounds, 500 pounds more than what this legislation would propose. With another bill in Florida, having passed committee on the floor unanimously and sitting on Governor DeSantis' desk. Regionally, Minnesota is literally surrounded by states that already permit weights at or exceeding was proposed in this Senate file. And going further, states like California and Colorado don't even have weight limits. So Polaris doesn't bring these products to market alone. We have partners, 120 of them across Minnesota, dealers, small, medium-sized suppliers that touch hundreds of communities across our state. We're very proud to, to work with them, but they're really what helps to bring this, these products to life. These are small businesses. These are job creators across Minnesota that help us do this. And then that, that investment that they make, that we make with them, then translates into the lodges, restaurants, uh, other small businesses in your communities across Minnesota. And then finally, I would say this legislation is not new. It's been around for, the concept has been around for a couple of sessions and it's been discussed for a few years. It's been a combination of discussions with organizations like Polaris, but other manufacturers, ATV Minnesota, their clubs, other dealers, suppliers, the DNR, and other major stakeholders in this discussion. So Madam Chair, I wanna just again say thank you for, for the opportunity for us to say a few words in support of this legislation and for you hearing this bill. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, Mr. Burke, I think members, I think we'll hold our questions to the end, but I do have one while you're sitting at the table. So just for the lay person, could you explain what a class two ATV is? Because I, I think, you know, um, just for us who uh, may not know that. Yeah, Madam Chair, members, great question. Um, you know, uh, quickly, you know, we started with dirt bikes, then we went to three wheelers, then four wheelers came along, three wheelers went away, and then four wheelers turned into what we often think of as side-by-sides or UTVs. And those are multi-passenger machines that you often see they're sitting side by side, individuals sitting side by side. They have steering wheels generally versus handlebars. They have bucket or um, bench seating versus the straddle variety. And they, they actually have the added benefit class twos. Generally they're, they're wider, they're heavier. Um, but what's great about them is they actually cut down on the volume of ATVs that operate on our trail systems because now instead of having uh, a husband and wife operating two ATVs across our trail systems, they get to ride together in one ATV. Um, and so class one is typically thought of as that traditional straddle seat handlebar variety and or class ones. And now class twos are that multi-passenger product. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that clarification. Only if I get to drive and my husband gets to be in the passenger seat. So. Perfect. <laughs> With that, next up we have... Um, Peter Gassett, uh, Duluth Lawn and Sport, and he is re remote. 
Welcome Thank you, to Madam the committee. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, kind of be a little repetitive on, on what Senator Johnson and Mr. Burke said. Um, excuse me, would you would you just identify yourself for the record? So I'm sorry. Know. My name is Peter Gasser from Duluth Lawn and Sport in Duluth, Minnesota. Thank you. So I just wanted to speak on a couple personal issues with this or my personal experience. I've been in this business for, for 40 years. Um, I've seen the change and even personally experienced the change. We've gone from single rider machines uh, to multi-passenger uh, UTVs or class two machines. It's, it's created more family oriented use, trail use of this. It used to be a lot of single guys um, and, and to a lesser extent, single women on ATVs. Now it's families going out sharing time. And my personal uh, experience, my wife and I have a six passenger one so we can take our grandchildren with us. Those machines are heavier as we put cabs on them and heaters on them for winter use. Those are the machines that would, would now become legal on Minnesota trails. Um, the next step is, is uh, Mr. Burke stated, Polaris has come out with electric machines. We're one of those dealers that was fortunate enough to sell everything we could get within a couple hours. And we have a, a very long waiting list of people that want to change from gas to electric vehicles and we need the extra weight capacity for those. And the last point I would like to make is, is we're literally on the border. I can look out my window here and see the Wisconsin border. We do a lot of business there. We have trail system that connects Minnesota and Wisconsin. These machines will be legal in Wisconsin right now, but they're not legal in Minnesota without the weight change. Um, so those are the three points that I would like to leave you with. And thank you for your time. Next, we have uh, uh, Mr. Bone from the ATV Minnesota. And uh, Mr. May, you might as well uh, come up also at the same time. Mr. May, I think we just had a conversation the other day, did we not? <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, my name is Ray Bone, and I'm here representing uh, ATV Minnesota today. Um, this is a is a very complex issue. When when uh, Polaris first brought this to our organization, um, we had some we had some concerns. I think serious concerns. And in fact, last year, some of you may remember when we were asked if we supported this definitional change, we said we were neutral on it because we really had some a very vigorous. In fact, probably probably the most vigorous debate I've heard in my. Well, I've been representing that uh, uh, since 1991. So uh, one of the most vigorous debates I've heard internally. There's a, there was a lot of concern about how these would, um, uh, how they would affect the trails, this additional weight, and um, you know, how, uh, how that would impact the, the, the concern we had is how it's gonna impact the, the maintenance fund, those sorts of things. We have spent in the state has invested a lot of money in our trails and we just are not willing to sit back and see them damaged. And not only that, uh, we have a, a tremendous number of volunteers out there working on the trails. And frankly, I'm sure they got better things to do than spend all their time fixing up trails. So, so there was a lot of pretty strong debate and, and we had a lot of discussions with Polaris and other folks. So um, we came to the conclusion in the end that, and, and I'm gonna have um, a real engineer, and that's Mr. May, who's gonna be talking in a minute, uh, tell you why we came to the conclusion it was, it was okay. That, that, and, and considering that it's gonna bring in the whole new machine, the electric machine, we thought it's very much worth it. And frankly, if, if, if there is a bit more maintenance work that needs to be done, uh, we, know, we, we think that uh, we've talked a couple of different options that we have to come back and make sure that we can, we can maintain those trails. Maintaining the trails and not overbuilding our trails without the maintenance money is a, is a key principle that we have. We, we cannot, build too many trails that we can't maintain 
But on the other hand, if we can develop trails and maintain them, that's the equilibrium that we wanna maintain because that's what's really important. We need to build sustainable trails and we need to keep those trails sustainable. So uh, with that in mind, I'm gonna ask uh, Perry May, who's the state director of the, um, of the ATV Minnesota and uh, to talk about uh, his discussions with the various clubs uh, that maintain these trails, what they thought, and then what his observations are as, uh, as a expert engineer. And he, he develops a lot of trails too and maintains them. So with that, if that's okay, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the committee, Mr. May. Please uh, thank you. identify yourself and uh, uh, go yeah. ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, Perry May. I'm the ATV director of Minnesota, ATV Minnesota, state director. I live in the Outing, Minnesota area, which is Kerry's district. So that's why we have conversations. Um, so um, I, some of the things that I just wanna share with you, number one, ATV Minnesota supports the increased weight limit for three primary reasons. Number one is to allow manufacturers such as Polaris to develop and design electric vehicles for our trails. And I think you've heard all the reasons behind that, a heavier battery, uh, electric motor, uh, it's gonna increase framework on these machines, uh, all those things. So we support the move to electric vehicles for future development. Secondly, ATV Minnesota is very firm and staunch on the 65 inch width limit for ATVs. The 65 inch width limit has more to do about trails than anything else in the ATV definition. If we would move away from that width limit, it would mean that we'd have to increase, increase the width of trails in our system. We'd have to increase the width of bridges and boardwalks. And if we had side-by-side -side traffic or two-way traffic, again, we would double the size of our trails. The other important thing about width, it limits the manufacture of what you can design from an engineering standpoint. You can only put in so much in a package. So if you were gonna go to a much larger engine, more capacity, you have to go wider. Some of us are old enough to remember the muscle cars of the 50s. The beginning motor manufacturers, when they started putting in larger motors, physically tore out the motor mounts of, engine, of the cars. They had to reinvent heavier frames. And so the 65 inch limit limits to what you can do on an ATV. So that's very important for our trails. The third main point that is going on today in our trails, we have the side-by-side -side type ATVs that are out there. Some of them are six passenger. Some of them dry weight capacity is 1,900, 1,950 pounds. By the time you put six average adults in there with gasoline and, and other things, you're already up over at 3,000 pounds on the trails today. If you're a person that uses your ATV, you and a friend, your wife, you go collect firewood. By the time you put four or 500 pounds of firewood in your ATV in the back compartment and you ride down the trails, you are at 2,500 or 3,000 pounds today. So we have many side-by-side -side versions when you include dry weight and live weight that are at 3,000 pounds today. Our trails can support 3,000 pounds today. Our bridges can, our boardwalks can, our soil types can, because we're proving that today. The, the, again, just wanna go back to the width. The width is our largest determining factor from good trail construction. Otherwise we'll start developing forest roads out there and we'll get into forestry, but we don't wanna do that. Thank you. And if you have any questions. Thank you. Um, please stay around in case we have questions. Um, next up, we have uh, Lori Prius uh, from Parks and Trails. Welcome to the committee.
Please state your name and uh, Madam your Chair, name. members, thank you for the opportunity to be here. My name is Laura Preuss. I'm a section manager with the DNR's um, Division of Parks and Trails. Uh, the Minnesota All ATV definition has been evolving over time, and this is a continuation of that. It includes major elements related to tires, weight, and width. Um, this proposed definition change makes changes to the tires and the uh, weight. I'll speak to each of these elements briefly. First, it's important to emphasize what this definition is not. As Perry May just shared with us, it does not change the width of the ATVs. This is very important from DNR's perspective because a change in width would actually be the greatest concern from a trail management and an enforcement perspective. And again, this definition does not change the width. Related to the tires, the proposed definition eliminates the requirement for low pressure or non-pneumatic tires, which was supported by DNR last legislative session. There's not a good definition for low pressure tires, hard to know exactly what that is, and it's hard to enforce. So DNR views this as a very straightforward change that will simplify the definition to today's standards uh, and also make it easier to enforce. Related to the topic of weight, the proposed definition increases the total allowable dry weight from 2,000 pounds to 3,000 pounds based on changing trends in the industry and customer demand. And our understanding of this part of the change as has been described in earlier testimony is that customers are really asking for a variety of larger machines that weigh more than 2,000 pounds, including some of those side-by-side uh, -side models with things, features and amenities like weather protecting cabs, um, as well as importantly, more and more people are interested in expanding into electric vehicles and that technical technology requires additional weight as previously described. So DNR believes that it's reasonable to accommodate some increase in weight, yet there's also some cautionary notes we'd like to share. To sum up some of the positive considerations for a weight change that you've heard is, uh, DNR really believes it is very positive that the industry is advancing opportunities for ATV electric vehicles. We're supportive of that transition um, and it does require uh, greater weight. DNR also notes that some of these uh, variety of new heavier models are coming onto the market and customers can be frustrated if they can't legally register them uh, and it can also be difficult to enforce if we're not sure about that weight. And finally, as been noted, um, a weight change would be consistent with some other states. Um, for example, Wisconsin just increased from 2,000 to 3,000 pounds this last legislative session. The cautionary issue that we'd like to share is that at the same time, we note that we don't have uh, an entire full understanding of the implications of the weight change. We don't know the full extent of crossing and trail bridges in the grant and aid system or club trails. And so from DNR, we, we can't know for sure uh, the entire implications of that weight change for those crossing or bridges in the grant and aid system. And so for this very reason, last legislative session, DNR testified that we had a preference to first complete a state inventory and master plan uh, before proceeding with this change. That would allow us to bring some of that information to bear on the consideration, as well as if there were any uh, crossings or places that needed to uh, be addressed, there would be an opportunity to do so before that change. Uh, and as a quick update on that, an RFP has been issued in 2021. We brought on a contractor to do that work and we expect that that inventory should be done by this fall and the master plan must be completed by February, 2023. So in sum, uh, these adjustments to the definition are not unexpected to see and we've already uh, supported the language changes related to the tires. Regarding weight, uh, we are not opposed, but consistently with how we testified last session, ideally we would wait until there's um, the opportunity to see the ATV trail inventory results, which would allow us to make any adjustments or modifications as needed. That said, we understand why groups are bringing forward the weight change as an evolution to the definition. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and maybe you would like to say at the table because there might be some questions there. And then we have um, Mr. Payne, who is remote. Welcome to the committee. Uh, Mr. Payne, I believe you're muted. Okay, you thank you. Just gotta click this off. You can yeah. hear me now? No, you're fine. You're thank fine. You, Just Senator identify Aaron. yourself for the tape and we'll be good. 
Yes, my name is Gary Payne. I live in Brainerd, Minnesota. I live on Gull River, actually, which is just outside of Brainerd. Um, and thank you for the time. Um, I'm uh, presently senior sociologist at Central Lakes College in Minnesota. Um, I've taught uh, at Bemidji State University. I taught a graduate level class for teachers at, at, State, uh, at Bemidji State University. And I taught at South Dakota State University when I was uh, finishing my PhD. Um, I'm presently the senior sociologist, meaning the oldest sociologist at Central Lakes College. Um, um, but I speak here only for myself today. Uh, the present day role of a sociologist is changing. Right now, it, it, uh, survival uh, is, it seems to be the issue. How do you keep 7 billion people on a planet alive and doing something that's fun and uh, making life worthwhile? Um, and I get the idea of recreation. I used to drive a, a dirt bike myself uh, back in the day. Um, so I, I, I get the, the, uh, the benefits of and the fun of, of vehicles and things like that. But things are changing. The issue before us today uh, is the challenge of, of uh, this, um, the matter of the weight limits. Um, right now, the Ukraine issue uh, has eclipsed all other news, but when that is over, or even if it's never over, I think we're gonna find that um, uh, the bigger challenge that's facing us is um, you know what's happening to the planet in terms of climate and toxins and exotics and all the things that we're facing. Um, so th this is you know this is your your job today to decide this one little issue. Um, we obviously need to be using less energy, uh, not just because again of the Korean, uh, Ukraine matter, but because of the the releases that are changing life as we know it on the planet. Uh, raising the weight limit on ATVs contradicts both the requirements of, of, of wildlife habitat and uh, energy use. Um, it's true that the electric vehicles would be an improvement. I'm glad to hear that people are looking into that, but they also need to be recharged and that requires energy, coal-fired plants and, and other things that it would be nice if it was all solar and wind, but we're not there yet. And besides that, this, as far as I can tell, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, this, uh, this bill would still allow larger gas vehicles as well. So we would, you know, and I would not be surprised to find uh, people buying more of the, of the larger gas vehicles than the electric vehicles. Uh, it's hard to tell how that's gonna go, but at any rate, this is an energy intensive thing and at a time when we really need to be reducing our footprint on the planet, this is literally increasing that. Uh, with weight and mass and horsepower is gonna become more uh, erosion, I would assume uh, more dust. Um, and you know we're, we're going the wrong way on this. It encourages our young folks, you know, as we buy these things, as, as, uh, these, these motorized vehicles, uh, it encourages them to, to see uh, recreation that is energy intensive as, as common and, and normal, uh, but it, this is something new. Uh, the, you know, ATVs were practically non-existent when we were, most of us were young, and now they're all over the place. Um, but right now, what the young folks are facing in terms of medical issues is obesity, and diabetes and the kinds of, of uh, illnesses that come from um, really being seated, uh, being uh, uh, on their backsides most of the time. They'd be much better off walking, hiking, and biking, uh, skiing, and doing something to move rather than just be seated in a, in a vehicle that's smoky or that requires uh, energy uh, from coal-fired plants. Um, and there, another problem with, I think, these vehicles that's already existing right now, you don't have to wait for it, is the, the, the question of the image of these vehicles is, is a violation of multiple use. 
for most uh, berry pickers and backpackers and skiers and bicyclists um, and photographers, wildlife photographers like myself, the, the size of these great big ATVs, the, the ones that are on there now, never mind the bigger ones that you're talking about, is very intimidating. Uh, these are public lands. They should be for everybody, not just some people that want to drive uh, large vehicles through our wild areas. And so that's, you know, that's a violation. This would, this bill, uh, if passed, would just uh, exacerbate that situation. I'm used to speaking in 50 minute intervals and I'm gonna spare you that. So I've scribbled some notes down here. Uh, now in your lifetimes, in our lifetimes, and even if you're a lot younger than me and most of you are, um, Audubon Society has said that, that we have reduced the bird population by a third. We've lost a third of all bird species. And that's just one example of what's happening to the biota on the planet. Um, you know, we're not, we're, we are not taking care of our wild and undeveloped areas in ways that would encourage, you know, um, wildlife to survive. In fact, we're going the, the opposite direction. And this is another move in that direction where we're trying to go through these wild areas with motorized vehicles, which are themselves uh, intimidating, not just <laughs> hikers and bikers and bicyclists, but to, to bird life and other critters. So, uh, you know, my feeling is that, that uh, and I'm sure there's plenty that agree with me, uh, that this bill moves us in the wrong direction on energy use, on carbon releases, erosion control, and the multiple use uh, legitimacy of our public lands. There's already enough public access for these vehicles. They are large enough already. P people can, can continue to do what they're doing and they will, regardless of what I uh, want, I'm sure. But uh, the question is, does it make any sense to keep increasing the size? You know, whatever the other states do, that's their business. We're Minnesota. We're not a, a, any other state. We have to decide what we want for ourselves. And, uh, and I think this, is, this is, goes too far. I urge you to vote against this bill and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Payne. I appreciate your comments. Um, I believe, uh, Senator Johnson, that is all of your testifiers, correct? Members, are there questions? Um, Senator Lang, before you go, I'm just, I, I would just like to, um, I have one question that I, that I wrote down here about the 3,000 pounds. Um, so right now we're doing, we have um, a weight limit and the dry weight and the, you add the people or the firewood, you're going to bring up to 3,000 pounds. But what happens when we start at 3,000 pounds? What does that added weight look, look like? I mean, um, they say that trails can keep 3,000 pounds. Now you're gonna add other things that, you know, you're gonna go with your packs and your people and, and stuff. So what, what do you think the average adding that on w would be? I mean, are you talking another 1,000 pounds or I mean, I know it's how many donuts you ate this morning, but. <laughs> <laughs> Which would add probably about five pounds. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll refer to one of my uh, more knowledgeable tests. Mr. May tests. talked about that, and I, I guess I'd like to hear what, you know, um, what his kind of comment on that would be. Yes, very good question. Thank you. Um, I've thought about the same question, and I've uh, deliberated myself with, What's the possibilities of even a larger engine when we go to 3,000 pounds? And you come back, and again, I should have repeated before, um, just so for some credibility for myself, I am a former engineering manager with General Mills, did that for 31 years. So uh, I'm speaking from an engineering standpoint, but again, when you if, you, if you have a box, okay, there's only so much that you can fit in that box. So even if we go to 3,000 pounds, so I, I'm going to compare this to the Polaris uh, crew six-seater, which you've mentioned. So could you have people along with additional live weight? So when you go to an, uh, an EV vehicle, you're going to have to put that battery somewhere, okay? That's going to take the place of maybe one or two people, okay? So that's going to kind of box out of there. In replace of the combustion engine, you have to put electric engine. And then of course you got extra framework again. 
So at, at the width level, the only real thing you could do is to go longer, turn into like a school bus type of scenario, or go higher, which raises your center to your center of gravity. So from practical design limits, if you do go to the 3000 pound weight, and if that's all, you know, um, a battery and motor, okay, if you go extra live weight, um, there's not really a place to put that extra live weight in this box in the 65 inch footprint. Again, you'd have to go wider to make it more stable uh, to do that. So I think there's trade-offs there. Um, so I don't see, you know, even at 3000 pounds, um, if, if, if you put all that into the, the vehicle, um, could you get live weight up to 4,000 pounds? I, I, I'd like to see that myself from a design standpoint. I think that would be very challenging. I could see 3,200, 3,300, maybe 3,500, but I, much more than that, you're, it's, it's gonna get very challenging from an engineering standpoint. Thank you, I appreciate that Thank explanation. Um, Senator Lang, you had a question. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and this may be uh, for Mr. Burke or maybe for Mr. Gasser, probably the both of you actually. Um, we've kind of been running around the edges of weights. Um, what, what does an actual, I've been trying to look it up and look for this. Uh, what does it, I don't think Polaris offers a six seater in electric right now, but what does the standard 1500 pound cast version weigh when you make it electric? Because we've kind of been talking about it. We're not actually talking actual pounds yet. So what, what are we, what are we looking at? Mr. Burke. Yeah, Madam Chair, Senator Lang, um, it's a great question. The, so when we launched the Polaris Kinetic XP last year in December, the pre-production um, estimates <clears throat> for a one row seat variety of that machine was uh, 1,780 pounds. Okay, so just you know, a couple hundred pounds off the existing weight limit. When you add a cab on there, which we've already talked about consumers wanting, which is probably around 250, 300 pounds, you're over the limit. So then as, as you've seen, I'm not, I'm not saying anything that's protected here, but you know, then you go from a, a single passenger row to a multi-passenger row. The, the Polaris uh, crew, North Star crew with the cab system is a perfect example of that. And you get higher. Um, what we have suggested is that 3,000 pounds provides the industry a, a large enough threshold to help us innovate within that space while also addressing the live weight that Perry talked about, which is, okay, once you have the physical size of the machine, and then you, you know, in, in a turn, internal combustion engine, you're putting, you're putting gas in there at about seven pounds a, a gallon, you know, probably 13 to 14 gallon capacity. So you're bringing about 70 additional pounds in there. You're putting people in there. Um, maybe a cooler or, you know, tent or whatever it is you do, you use this machine for. Um, but then if you go to a electric powered machine, you still have some fluid weight um, to, to run that machine, but um, you're really talking about people. And so just to put things in perspective today, Polaris has a Ranger XP 1000 that weighs 1,934 pounds. With outdoors. With, yeah, with, with nets. So when someone like Peter at Duluth Lawn and Sport registers that machine, he can register it legally as a class two ATV. But when his customers get in it and they're on the trail, it's going to be over 2000 pounds. So that's the practical consideration that we're talking about when we say 3000 pounds is that we're going to go over 2000 pounds at some point. We already are in terms of practical use. Um, but 3,000 pounds, we feel like provides enough of a window for the engineering teams at companies like Polaris and others to innovate in that space and then bring those, those, those um, products to market through dealers like, like Peter and, and others and still provide us a, a level of certainty for land managers like at the DNR or the clubs and, 
and, and frankly, federal land managers too. Senator Lang. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm gonna open up a new can of worms. We talk about environmental impact when it comes to these trails and how heavy these machines are. I think we're missing a part of the equation. It has everything to do with, and this is what got me thinking, is the low pressure tires. Um, when we talk, it, just out of curiosity, and I don't know if any other states are doing this, but is it something where we can measure what the, the ground pressure is on these vehicles? Because I think that has a lot more to do with the impact on the environment than what the weight of the vehicle does in all honesty. I think what are, what are those tires, you know, uh, if it's a big wide tire with a heavy machine versus the same machine with a narrow tire on it, I think, you know, you're talking about two different things here and the practicality of what we can accomplish with wide tires, I think all, all of a sudden we don't have this conversation about weight like we are right now, so. Mr. Burke. Madam Chair, Senator Lang, I, <laughs> I kid you not that I have not discussed this with him because I literally looked at our per tire weight on the, the, the XP Kinetic last night. Oh, I had one of our design engineers provide it to me. And it's any, so we measure it at each tire. So what the left front, right front, left rear and, and right rear. And we, what, we, what we measure is called the contact patch. Basically, where does the rubber touch the, touch the surface of the, of the earth? <clears throat> and it's, it varies on the front and on the rear based off of where you put the engine and other components, but it's anywhere between 300 and 400 pounds. It's distributed across the entire machine. And as Perry talked about, it's also limited because we can only put so much in a certain size machine. So, and, and also have to meet industry standards for stability, lateral stability. We need to make sure that these machines can operate on uneven terrain, unimproved terrain safely, right? So the, the history around tires is that low pressure tires that, you, that we've all seen on ATVs today. They're soft, they are very rudimentary. They're just lugs, right? Um, but what they do is they're designed to grab unimproved surfaces and stick and make sure that the user has the ability to safely navigate at speed on uneven terrain, unimproved terrain. The technology in tires today is so much more improved, but with that, with that improvement, we're also able to widen them, stretch them a little bit, which also increases the size of the contact patch and decreases the pound per square inch that we actually put on the earth. So I hope that without, you know, eating all the worms that you just opened up, <laughs> um, that makes some sense. Senator Lang, even I understood that. That was great. <laughs> so <clears throat> that can of worms being open. What and this, I'm not gonna make you speak for the entire industry, of course, but how do we, as a legislature, uh, how do we address that? How can we be more scientific in our approach? How do we adapt and say, yeah, 3,000 pounds is well within the limits of what uh, not only you can, you and other manufacturers can produce and we can, we can legislate, we can write all the bills in the world, talks about weight, but really where the, the rubber meets the road, um, we can be smarter about that. So how do we do that? Do we set up a, a, a testing facility where a, a conservation officer that pulls a vehicle over can put a, a one square inch peg on the ground, drive over it and say, yeah, that one meets standards. It's 3,700 pounds, but the ground impact is such that it's not gonna affect this trail. It's, it's built the right way, the operator and the manufacturer uh, the guy that put this shiny rims on it after the fact in the aftermarket knows what he's doing and he did it so he can compensate for a four-door ranger pulling a trailer with full load of wood down the same trail, uh, which has been done uh, by this guy. Um, that I'm, I, I'm, you know, using my equipment uh, in a fashion that is compliant to what we're trying to accomplish here, so. Yeah, Mr. Burke. Madam Chair, uh, Senator Lang and, and members, I, I highlighted during my testimony that this hearing is the culmination of years of discussion. And it truly is. Um, Polaris has sought in every 
facet to be fact-based. We have um, worked with the DNR in, in many instances and folks like ATV Minnesota, our dealers, our clubs, to rely on um, our engineers to provide information when we can. Some of it, of course, is sensitive because we compete um, and we want Minnesota to win. And that's why we're here. Um, but we have, uh, in, and this isn't, you know, I don't want to speak out of turn, but what I often say when I, when I collaborate, frankly, with the DNR and others is that, believe it or not, the, they, we're, your customers are our customers first. Because we don't just put our thumb up in the air and say, we hope the wind blows in the direction of this, you know, tens of millions of dollars of investment in a new piece of equipment that we hope people will buy and that they, we hope will be registered and we hope they will buy trail passes for and they will hope that they will go to the market and use. Instead, we share as much information as we can, including things like discussions around contact patch and vehicle design and so on and so forth in order to help make the DNR un better understand who the customer is and where they are going so that we can do what we're talking about today, which is design trails and design restrictions if needed to ensure that the DNR's mission, as well as the mission of the clubs and others around the state can, to, can be to continue to manage, and that's the key word, manage our public lands, which they do effectively. Four of the seven metro counties are the highest household, or highest number of households with registered ATVs in the state. Yet the highest number of use the highest number of uh, counties with use are in places like Candy Ohio County or Cass County or Crow Wing County or Itasca County, St. Louis County. That is indicative of a managed system. Many, many Metro residents own ATVs, but they use them where they're designed to be used. And so as we look at what our part is in, in promoting the effective and, and managed use of ATVs, we will provide whatever information that we can and work with enforcement, frankly, because there's a significant uh, importance of deterrence around here to provide machines that are easily identifiable to DNR enforcement and other local law enforcement to make sure that they can easily identify machines that should be on this trail, should not be on this trail, should be directed toward another trail and so on and so forth. Thank you. And with that, members, I think we've had a really good, robust discussion here today. And, um, and, and one of the things I would like to say is I had a great conversation um, with Mr. May. And I, I think going forward, the change that I see in ATVs over the years is they're doing a trail up in Emily, Minnesota. And the partners on that trail are the Lake Association, the property owners, MnDOT, the DNR, and the AT club, ATV clubs. And they've all, all gotten together to work hard to realize what needs to happen to move that trail for safety, for the environment, and for the enjoyment of the clubs. And I think that is a really amazing move forward um, that we've done in the state of Minnesota. We've gotten away from the turf thumb and who's, who's, who's doing what. And working together to make this trail system work for everyone I think is an amazing accomplishment. And I, I just wanna compliment the whole group for, for doing that because to bring all the user groups back together again is, is a pretty amazing thing. So with that, Senator Sengen, we had one, we have two more bills up, so. Uh, Madam Chair, and I'll just ask it this way. Uh, and it's maybe just to think about not even the answer, but could an unintended consequence of this language be that, uh, that I, and I, we've got two of these, both Polaris, uh, could, uh, if I were a, a, a machinist, could, could I machine my own tires, put spikes on them, and drive on a trail if I was a nut job? <laughs> <laughs> because I think, I, I think that, that I think the way it's worded here, uh, I could do that. And so we can just leave it at that. But, but look at the language and see what it says because the words are the words. And I think, I think that would be allowable. The definition of tires does not mean rubber uh, per the dictionary. So Madam Chair, that's it. Thank you, Senator Sanjay. We will look at that. 
Um, I want to thank everyone today for this great conversation, and I hope to continue it and um, great answers today. And um, so with that, Senate file 3687 will be laid over for pop possible inclusion. Thank you. Senator Lang, I believe you're up next. Senate file 3869. Welcome, Senator Lang, and proceed when you're ready. Well, good afternoon, Madam Chair, and I appreciate uh, you hearing the bill 3869, which we have for you this afternoon. Um, 3869 uh, is actually a fairly simple change, uh, and it was brought to me by uh, Mr. Bone, actually. Uh, in an effort to streamline the process of registering ATVs. Uh, in the past, they've had issues with uh, locating, uh, as you can see in line 1.12, well, who is the registered owner versus who is the current owner? Because oftentimes these vehicles uh, are not registered. They don't always have to be registered as it is legally required if you have it on your own property, if you have it uh, on your own accord and you're not on trails, obviously and it could go from hand to hand to hand. So they've had issues with that in the past. So that is in entirety uh, my understanding of the bill and my, uh, or my intent with it. Um, today with you, I have a couple of testifiers. That, I don't know who would like to go first. Tom is here. I've never met Tom, but I appreciate him coming. Welcome to the committee uh, and please identify yourself and proceed when you're ready. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. And thank you, Senator Lang, for authoring this for us. Uh, this is actually one that I brought forth originally. And uh, I should mention, I'm Tom Humphreys, and I work with or represent the Amateur Riders Motorcycle Association, also known as District 23 of the American Motorcyclists Association. So we represent um, off highway motorcycles, or a lot of people refer to them as dirt bikes in the state of Minnesota. And this is something that we were running or hearing from our members that they were unable to register used machines that they had purchased. And you would start looking in forums or Facebook groups, and I would see these threads of hundreds of comments that basically were saying, I guess the state doesn't want my money. I can't convince them to take my money to register this machine that I bought. And as we heard on the previous bill, there's funding side to this. So these registration dollars are used for maintenance, trail creations, all those enforcement, all these types of things. So what we found, and I worked with the License Bureau at the DNR, was to try to understand how and why is this a problem. And the issue has come that in our language, currently, it says that the transfer must be executed by the registered owner. That is in a closed system. That's why we have to do our registrations through uh, the deputy registrars and that you know we can't go look up and see who was the previous owner so what we've it was exasperated during the the covid times when recreation just boomed there were a lot of people buying used machines and then fixing them up and selling them well they weren't transferring the registration into their name so if i bought a machine from somebody but i knew i was just going to flip it and then senator lang purchased it from me and he has a bill of sale for me that says i sold it to him when he goes to register it he can't do it because he has my name, not that previous owner who was the registered owner. So it's just become a real big challenge for us to figure out how to move forward. There is a process. You do have to go to the DNR in St. Paul or work with them. They can look up who the previous registered owner was. They can get a form from you that says you would like them to reach out to that individual via the registered the address that happened to be on record, who knows if it's still current or not. And then they would send something to them and ask them to contact you to say that, yes, they had sold it to somebody who now sold it to you. So it turned out it was a process that didn't work very well. It was rather cumbersome. They didn't wanna do it very often. And working with that department, I also was informed, we don't have this problem with boats because it doesn't say registered owner, it says owner in the legislation. We worked, uh, we tried to do this last year 
and we worked um, with the department. The department was a little bit concerned on that. And we met with them over the summer on coming up with a language. Uh, we had a number of meetings with them and this was what we came up with is the cleanest, simplest way was to switch it to current owner, which is who the bill of sale would be from Thank when you, you bought a used machine. Uh, I, I can oh, I add one thing. Oh, I do sure. want to mention Sorry. really quick that uh, when I did bring forth this issue, I did connect with uh, ATV Minnesota and Minnesota United Snowmobiles Association to check and see if they were having the same issue. Because in looking at uh, statute, they had the same language. And all three of them agreed, or the other two plus us agreed that yes, they had the same issues and that they were supportive after they went through their boards of making this change. So this um, bill before us does change it for all three vehicle types. Thank you, Mr. May. Yep, Perry May, uh, State Director for ATV Minnesota. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, I'm just here to uh, support Tom and the rest of the recreational industry that this is also a common problem with ATVs. So Tom's talking about off-highway motorcycles, but he brought it. We have a meeting called the Minnesota Motorized Trails Coalition, Min USA, ATVs, ARMCA. And we found out it's a common problem in our industry also. So our ATV Minnesota here is just to also support uh, the legislation here. Thank you. Members, other questions? Well, I'll just say that um, I know that I purchased, and I'm sorry they're not Polaris, but we, my boys had, had uh, two John Deere's and when they were little. And so we painted them black and put racing stripes on them. And, you know, they've probably been sold and, and traded uh, probably 10 times from now. And who knows where they are and, the, and where the titles are. So I think this is a really good piece of legislation that will help a lot of folks out. So thank you, Senator Lang, for bringing this forward. Well, and with you, that, members, we will lay over 3869 for possible inclusion. Senator Weber, I believe the gavel is yours. Very good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we will turn to Senate file 4131 at this point. And uh, I believe that uh, in looking at the agenda, all of the testifiers will be remote. Uh, and so uh, with that, uh, Senator Rood, uh, welcome and please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the constitutional pro uh, protection around the LCC MR funds will expire at the end of 2024. And this legislation would put the reauthorization on the ballot in 2024. Um, we think we need to pass this this year because as you know, it takes quite a while to get a campaign going to inform voters, let them know uh, what we're trying to do. Um, this, this has been around for a while. And so while people take it for granted, um, they might need some education on exactly what they'll be voting on at the ballot box. So currently 40% uh, of the lottery net proceeds are deposited in the environmental trust fund. And this constitutional amendment would change that amount to 50% of the net proceeds. And the reason for that is when this uh, bill originated, it was at 50%. And then at the last minute was changed to 40. And we'd really like to honor the, the original intent of that bill and put it back up to 50%. So how much would this change the cost? Well, going from 40 to 50% would increase uh, the fund uh, about and reduce the general fund about $12 million a year. And the other change that we're making in this bill is, you know, we pay out the, the prizes and some people buy that lottery ticket and they scratch it up and it goes in the glove box or it goes somewhere else. And that is an unclaimed prize. And there's a certain amount of time that has to um, be met before, they, before it's, it is an unclaimed prize. But that money goes back into the general fund and I don't think that's what it was meant to do. I think that those dollars need to go back into the environmental fund um, because they were originally purchased for that. And so those, this bill puts those unclaimed funds back into um, the environmental fund. So uh, with that, I have, um, I believe three, three testifiers remote. Um, very, very good, thank you, uh, Senator Rood. Our first testifier that's listed is Dave Carlson, president of the Minnesota Outdoor Heritage Alliance. 
Uh, Mr. Carlson, please identify yourself for the record and you may proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and fellow committee members. My name is Dave Carlson, president of the Minnesota Outdoor Heritage Alliance. We are a group of uh, organizations that, are, that represent uh, the sportsmen and, win, sportsmen and women's interests down at the state capitol. And I'm here to testify today in support of Senate File 4131. Um, the Environmental Trust Fund is a dedicated fund that's really important to the sportsmen and women. Uh, we only have a handful of dedicated funds. And, you know, I've, I've had conversations with people uh, specifically about the Environmental Trust Fund, and they say, well, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there that uh, sportsmen and women really don't care about. And, and that's just not true. Uh, since the beginning, uh, millions and millions of dollars have gone into research projects that benefit sportsmen and women, fish, wildlife, and habitat all over the state. Uh, just a few examples, uh, you know, providing funding for a forest management assessment tool. Uh, a big one to us is building knowledge and capacity for aquatic invasive species solutions, uh, prairie butterfly conservation. Sportsmen and women are we're interested in, in uh, pollinators. Um, there are just so many different programs, and these programs would it would be very hard to just get funding for this research and these other programs out of the general fund. So I just wanna say that sportsmen and women of Minnesota support this Senate file 4131 and look forward to the reauthorization of the Environmental Trust Fund. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. And if you would stay on uh, with case there's questions after all the testifiers, we would appreciate it. Next, we will turn to Will Clayton, Sr., a regional representative, Pheasants Forever. Welcome to the committee, uh, Mr. Clayton, and please identify yourself for the record and begin when ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. <clears throat> My name is Will Clayton. I'm a senior regional representative of Pheasants Forever. Uh, and on behalf of this organization and our 20,000 Minnesota members, I'm happy to express our support for SF 4131, constitutional amendment providing for the renewal of the Environment and Natural Resource Trust Fund. The goals of the Environment and Natural Resource Trust Fund align perfectly with the mission of Pheasants Forever. Our organization is full of conservationists, and there's no doubt many of our members are licensed buyers, often traveling across the state in pursuit of high quality upland habitat each fall, but my role within this organization is to serve these members. And I can tell you that they care about pheasants and pheasant hunting, but they're also passionate about pollinators, water quality, climate change, and outdoor recreation. In the past, our uh, membership in Pheasants Forever has used the Environment and Natural Resource Trust Fund to permanently protect habitat, restore wetlands, complete habitat improvements. But additionally, one of the more recent programs funded by the Environment and Natural Resource Trust Fund is the Minnesota Bee and Beneficial Species Habitat Restoration Project. Here, Pheasants Forever worked with the U of M and a host of local partners, including the Minnesota Honeybee Producers, City of Detroit Lakes, Root River Parks Department, Clay County, and many private landowners to create 1,950 acres of quality pollinator habitat, while simultaneously doing research to improve the methods for pollinator habitat creation. Pollinators are critical to our food systems and incentivizing in the establishment of their habitat through this unique partnership is an excellent example of the power of the Environment and Natural Resource Trust Fund. Another successful collaboration uh, between Pheasants Forever and Environment and Natural Resource Trust Fund is the Farm Bill Assistance Partnership Program. Oftentimes, Pheasants Forever uses these dollars as leverage, matching them many times over to stretch their impact across the landscape. And this funding has been instrumental in making sure that we have individuals working with landowners and producers to increase voluntary conservation program adoption. I started my career as a farm bill biologist and I know full well the impact these positions make in their local communities. This program is critical to delivering protection, conservation, preservation and enhancement of the state's air, water, land, fish, wildlife, and other natural resources for the public benefit of all Minnesotans. 
The Environment and Natural Resource Trust Fund is the source of many great investments for fish and wildlife, and I've just highlighted a couple. I appreciate living in a state that makes these kind of investments, and there's 20,000 members behind me that hopes we can continue to invest for another 25 years. And I appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts and Pheasants Forever support for Senate File 4131, the Constitutional Amendment providing for the renewal of the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clayton. Our third testifier is Brad Gaussman, Executive Director of Minnesota Conservation Federation. Mr. Gaussman, please uh, introduce yourself and do, for the record, you may proceed when ready. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair and members of the committee for allowing me to speak today. My name is Brad Gaussman. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Conservation Federation. Our organization represents individual members, sporting and conservation clubs throughout the state. And since 1936, Minnesota Conservation Federation has been an advocate for the woods, water, and wildlife in our great state. Throughout our organization's history, we have consistently advocated for increased funding for conservation work in Minnesota. Our work in support of the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund goes back to before the original passage of the fund. Two months before voting day in the fall of 1988, our members gathered for the MCF annual meeting to pass resolutions relating to our conservation work. Our members saw that funding in support of natural resources conservation had stagnated and that the need for such a funding source like the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund was more important today than ever before. The resolution passed and it was resolved that the Minnesota Conservation Federation urges the Minnesota legislature to support the constitutional dedication of revenues for the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. In November of 1988, the citizens of Minnesota went to the polls and approved the creation of the trust fund. The December 88 issue of our Minnesota Out of Doors newspaper paper proclaimed that trust fund wins big and reported that over 80% of voters had approved the creation of the trust. Success stories of projects funded by monies from the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund are many and have specifically benefited the sporting public in Minnesota. Land acquisition projects have increased lands available for hunting and funds spent to combat the spread of aquatic invasive species have benefited those who fish, swim, and recreate in our state's waters. Recently, the spread of chronic wasting disease in white-tailed deer has been a topic of concern for many of our state's deer hunters and white-tail enthusiasts. Through funding originating from the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund and the LCCMR's Emerging Issues Account, Minnesota leads the nation in the development of new CWD surveillance technologies. The RT Quick Test, which was developed at the Minnesota Prion Research and Outreach Center at the University of Minnesota, allows for more advanced testing of living cervid animals such as deer to analyze the threat posed by this spreading and always fatal disease. Since the original passage of the trust, the problems facing our environment have only grown more complex. At this time, we have the opportunity to continue the important work that was first supported by our state's residents over 30 years ago. A renewal of the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund will help to ensure that the woods, waters, and wildlife enjoyed by those who fish, hunt, camp, bike, hike, or paddle will be available for the next generation of outdoor enthusiasts who come after us. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Gaussman. Members of the committee, are there any questions for our testifiers? Senator Herr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I uh, don't have a question, but I just wanna make comments in supporting this legislation. I wanna thank uh, our uh, chair, Senator Rood, uh, for including me as, uh, as co-author of this bill and making it bipartisan. Um, support is, is needed. And I want, also want to thank um, those who work on this leg legislation early on in, in its inception in the 90s and the voters that make, set up, make it possible for us to set this course for conservation and uh, preservation of our environment. Um, I'm also a member of the LCCMR too, so I see the importance of this <coughs> extension of uh, the sunset and getting ready for 2024. Uh, uh, in terms of, you know, because we, we are having a proposal lining up uh, in terms of LCCMR uh, for clean waters and address climate change and also add 
onto diversity of our metro and suburb, suburb project and empower younger stewardship and stewardship of um, people of color and our emerging community. So I know that, you know, even agency uh, like Minnesota Outdoor Heritage, uh, Ducks Unlimited and uh, Pheasant Forever are re reaching out to our emerging community and they're really working with me in many degrees as if I'm the culture expert. And of course I am the culture expert in a sensible way. So um, thank you for keeping me uh, and including me in, in this bill. So um, I, I support uh, this bill moving forward. Mr. Thank Mr. you, Senator Herr. If there are no further comments or questions, uh, Senator Senjum. Uh, Madam Chair, or Mr. Chair rather, uh, I just wanna thank Senator good senator for bringing us forward senator rood uh this is this is important i think this has stood the test of time there's no question i i like the idea of taking this up to 50 percent uh, as i recall around here a long time ago this start this started out as 100 <laughs> percent as a, a so-called out there heritage fund uh, as i recall at least uh, uh I, I i i do hesitate a little bit about uh, completely eliminating the idea of any of this money spent on wastewater infrastructure when you travel this state, I mean, city after city after city have broken down uh, dilapidated non-compliant wastewater systems. Uh, and we rely on bonding for that uh, in the process, always like paying 50 more, you know, 30% more than we would if we just paid cash. Uh, my preference would be we leave that open and let the Citizens Commission, future legislatures decide that question. But uh, Senator Rood, thank you for bringing this forward. and. And uh, it will it will churn a little bit, but uh, I think it's a good idea. Hopefully, we get it on ballot. Thank you, Senator Sinjum. Um, there are no further questions. Uh, I will turn to Senator Rood for final comment and the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to read what will go on the ballot because I think it's really important. Uh, the bill we can talk about the bill, but what really will the voters see? And they'll see this: Shall the Minnesota Constitution be amended to protect? drinking water sources, protect water quality of lakes, rivers, and streams, and protect forests to improve air quality, wildlife habitat, natural areas, parks, and trails by extending from 2025 until 2050. And I hope that Bobby Lassart is gonna be here to see it renewed again. <laughs> uh, I, you know, it, this is such a, we are the envy of the, nature, uh, the nation by having this. But I tell you, it wouldn't have happened without Bob Lassart and his, truly his passion for the outdoors and his work on this issue. And this morning in the Environmental Finance Committee, Senator Bach talked about Bob Lassart and how when they were in the house and how passionate he was for this and how he got it to pass. And so uh, uh, Senator Lassart, I, I can't thank you enough for what you have done. And I'm just so glad that you were able to come today to see this pass out of our committee and um, for 20, uh, I, 25 years, can you believe it's been that long? But it, it's worked and it's a, great, it's, it's a great thing that Minnesota accomplished. And so you should be very proud of your legacy here. So um, with that, Mr. Chair, I would love to make the motion to pass this on to the Senate Environment Finance Committee. Thank you, Senator Rood. Senator Rood has moved that this bill be passed out of the committee and uh, re referred to Environment Finance Committee. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion is carried. The bill is passed and hereby re referred. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, everyone, we have completed our business for today. We stand adjourned.